Joining me here live on the phone line is the band's guitarist, Jason Beeler. Jason, how are you, man? I'm doing awesome, Eddie. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, it's good to have Saigon kick back. How did the he how the heck did this happen? I don't know. Uh, it's a sure sign of the coming apocalypse. Right now. <laughs> is there gonna uh, be is there gonna be locusts coming or what? Yeah, if you see any kind of horsemen coming down any place or uh, locusts, I would definitely start to take cover. But, but, I mean, it was fairly well known that there was, uh, I guess, a lot of animosity in the band in all the years that you guys were apart, and somehow, uh, here in 2013, you've put it all behind you and gone out, and I know just did a, a string of successful shows, including one more this Thursday in New York. How did the seeds of this start again? I think we all just thought maybe we had a little bit of unfinished business. I don't even know that we fully, you know, buried the hatchet, so to say. I mean, there's a... There's still some tensions in there, but, you know, from my experience and my thoughts, and I think everyone kind of feels the same thing, like, you know, kind of uh, great things are born out of that kind of tension. Uh, when a band is holding hands, walking down the street singing songs together, it's, it's going to be a horrible experience for the listener. Well, yeah, it seems, it seems that is the case. It seems like there's tensions because, I mean, we've heard for decades about tensions in bands like Aerosmith and Motley and what have you, and those bands are still together. And ironically, there's two bands still with their original members who have a notorious history of you know, some tensions here and there. But they, they get through it. And you also hear, you know, the other thing I always found out, Jason, and I've never been a guy to do drugs or condone them, but I always find that when bands say, Oh, we were fucked up out of our mind when we made that record. It's usually their best record. <laughs> I don't know how that works exactly, but are you, are you telling are you telling me I should start doing drugs? No, not at all. I mean, uh, I don't know if you guys did drugs when you made those first two records, but whatever you did, just do more of that. Okay, fantastic. No, I mean, look, I mean, yeah, it's one of those things I don't think you can explain. I mean, you know, we, you know, all of my favorite bands obviously pretty much hated each other. So at the end of the day, I don't think fans of music really care. They just want the bands to, you know, shut up, play music, and get on with it. And uh, we've matured, I wouldn't say all the way, but enough to realize, like, we should just shut up and play and uh, get on with it. Well, for people that don't know the history with Saigon Kick, the first album comes out on Atlantic Records in 1990. Uh, I remember very well this record coming out because I was working for a subsidiary of Atlantic, which was Megaforce, and I knew all the people that worked with you and signed you and was marketing the band. I also remember uh, very vividly being friends with the guys in Skid Row, and you used Michael Wagner on that first record. And the story at least went back then that you, you had to do this record, the first album, in really quick time because he was committed to do their their next record if i'm not mistaken um talk about the origins of the band coming out of south florida and, and getting that record deal and getting signed and the experience of making that first record yeah, i mean we kind of did everything completely the wrong way um and it seemed to work for whatever reason i mean we uh we didn't have a demo tape we didn't really you know do all the things that normal bands do and we kind of got caught in this really weird period like where our biggest influences were like jane's addiction and that was kind of the first band that like was kind of combining that metal thing with the really kind of avant-garde approach and i realized like you know look we're never going to be that good looking glam band that you know, can get away with that we're never going to make it on our look so we were trying to combine a lot of that stuff it seemed to be the right vibe for our hometown and we started a massive like, a pretty sizable following down here what year did saigon kick start jason what year did the band first come together probably 89 90. so so not not all that long before you did the first record no, no, it really kind of came together, and, and uh, you know, so all of a sudden we were drawing like, you know, 2,000 people to these local shows, the labels came, and it was literally over like a period of a weekend where we went from just being this idea to, okay, you're signed to, you know, Atlantic Third Stone, and, you know, Michael Wagner's going to do your record, you're going to be in L.A. next week, and uh, it was kind of like, it was like this rocket took off, and, we, you know, we just kind of rolled with the punches from that point forward. And not only were you signed to Atlantic, but you mentioned Third Stone, which for people that don't know, that label, that was a record label that Michael Douglas, the actor, had. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Saigon Kick was the first band signed to it, right? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was such a surreal experience, you know, sitting in meetings with Michael Douglas talking about, you know, your record and what you're going to do. It's <laughs> very, very, uh, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you're still fans of people and... I remember pulling him aside once and being like, you know, Michael, I just, I, I don't want to feel like a tool, but like, you know, I happen to know you're in all these movies that I like. You know, he's like, oh, that's cool because no one ever says that, you know, to me, to my face. So it was actually cool. But he was a great guy and really music centered and, uh, and real supportive uh, initially. So it, it, it was a kind of really a uh, bizarre yet really cool experience. So he was actually, it wasn't just like a boutique thing where they just, uh, you know, they stuck his, his name on a record label. Michael Douglas was actually involved in his own record label? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, he actually really was. I mean, he was involved in, like, you know, helping us, you know, make decisions on video things, and we discussed different points of the record, and, uh, you know, he was, at, you know, he, he was a lot more, not that you wouldn't expect him to be music savvy, but, you know, he was, uh, you know, you, 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 hear, you hear all these nightmare stories about people trying to get involved in the music business that, you know, oh, I used to run a dry cleaning shop, or I used to run this, and you're just worried they're going to you know, have this input that's horrible. I mean, he really, you know, had valuable input. I mean, unfortunately, we were too young to listen to most of it, but, uh, you know, he, he, he was definitely there and supportive and let us make our own mistakes and was there to give us some advice. It was, it was a great experience. You talk about the origins of Saigon Kick and the direction of the band, and I'm somebody who has always said that your band, uh, I think, was... Um, way ahead of its time and and by that i mean some of the things you just touched on because you came out in 1990 at the height of the the whole glam and and i and people know i hate the term but the the quote unquote hair period um you guys kind of got pushed into that a little bit and i don't ever think the band had anything much to do with that especially from the sound i think if anything the sound of Saigon Kick, it, it, what, what caught my ear about it in the early 90s was how fresh and different it was. And now when I look back on it, it seems to me like it was very much a bridge to a combination of maybe a little bit of that scene, but also what was to come with you know, the Seattle sound and, and some of that sort of tone as well. It seems like I always thought Saigon Kick was a mesh of those two worlds. I mean, that's kind of where we... You know, the kind of cool thing about music right now is it's a lot more what I think we assumed it was going to be like then, where no one would care about genre, and, you know, if we could just do what we want to do. And whether the fans have kind of grown more mature musically or the, the timing's a little bit better for us now because we don't have to explain ourselves as much, the diversity thing now seems to be the... I mean, the things that really cursed us 20 years ago are the same things that I think make us interesting to go see now. Um, but yeah, we came out of that scene. We were playing with bands like Soundgarden. We toured with the Ramones. We toured with, you know, um, Faith No More. We did some shows with. I mean, so we were in that kind of scene. And then, you know, we I, I like to say we had the you know the hair ballad that took down the entire hair ballad scene. It was the last one, and uh, we paved the way without without, without us, like you know just laying that groundwork. You know, bands like Nirvana and that whole movement would have never had a chance. We had to take down the hair band movement. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, you're saying you're the gateway to bringing in the grunge thing and killing all the music before you? I, I don't want to say I'm responsible for Nirvana, but you get the point. <laughs> well, I mean, and what you're referencing is Love is on the Way, which was an a enormous ballad. Uh, we, we talked about this the other night. It went to number 12 on the pop charts from your second album, The Lizard. Uh, do you view that song as, a, as one of those two-edged swords, that it was it was great that you, you could say you've had a, a top 12 pop hit, but at the same token, it was maybe sent a little bit of a different message as to what Saigon Kick was about? You know, we, and you know this, because I mean, the first record had ballads on it. We, were, we never really thought about it or the ramifications or really kind of, we didn't even actually release that song. I mean, a couple of stations started playing it on their own, and it just kind of exploded. And at that time, I mean, I remember, I think it was Doug, you know, Doug Morris came to us and said, look, you know, you have a potential hit here, so you can keep wallowing about in obscurity and coolness. Or you can have this, you know, hit, and we were like, well, you know, we were just, we didn't feel like we had done anything different than we had done before. Um, obviously, it opened up a whole new audience to us, and a lot of those people were like, wait a minute, this whole record is, you know, horrible compared to this lovely ballad we love. And uh, right, Hostile and Youth, which I just played, is on that record. So, so you can imagine uh, going from that to Love Is on the Way, that the housewife crowd and the light radio crowd that brought that bought the album for that were a little yeah. bit when they heard Cruelty into Hostile Youth were a little bit like, whoa, what, what, what am I getting into here? We caused a bit of a ruckus in the soccer mom line uh, for sure there for a little bit. And uh, but you know, I mean, it, it, it's a great thing. I mean, the bottom line is more people heard the band, more people you know became exposed to the music, and you know, we I like. The cool thing is, like, I don't really ever make apologies for that stuff. I mean, that's the song we wrote. We recorded it. We had ballads on the later records, on the earlier records. We always did what we did. And, you know, you can't kind of control when and how a light's going to get, sh you know, shined upon what you're doing. And it was, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, he certainly did. I mean, I, I was, again, I was, I talked to Jason the other night on my on my other radio show, and I was uh, kind of half-joking about the fact that on the first uh, on the first album, there's a song called Come Take Me Now, which uh, Jericho was sitting in with me on that show, and he's committed that he's going to be sure that he fulfills my wishes and play that at my funeral. Um, although what I said to Chris is, how do you know that he won't go before I do? You know, that, that was the other thing. He was assuming that I'm going to kick before he does. So, you know, I know he's in better shape than me, but he's also a pro wrestler, you know, coming off that top rope. 
it's always it's always those fit guys that go down first. In exactly, my exactly. I mean, you know, they, they never know. But I mean, uh, talking about love is on the way. Uh, that's a song that you're the sole songwriter on, and you're the primary songwriter uh, in the history of the band. When you wrote that song, did you envision that I'm about to write a, a massive pop hit? Did you think it was something special? As you know, I mean, I'm, I always know exactly how to control the cultural movements of our generation. So it was a, uh, it was well plotted out, and you know, I had a PowerPoint presentation on it, and uh, this whole, you know, I was doing a seminar about how to write a pop hit in 15 minutes or less. And uh, no, I mean, you, you, you never know. I mean, you know, and and if you would have asked me at that time, I mean, you know, it was just one of those kind of songs. I mean, Extreme was a band we had toured with a bit during that time period. And, Obviously, they had massive success with more than words, and you know, it, it just, you know, the song just seemed to fit in. I mean, it's actually kind of different than most of the ballads of the time, but it just kind of took off at that point. I wish I could say I masterminded it and thought, you know, here's this evil plot to take over the airwaves kind of thing, but it really just happened. And that's a great parallel, though, with Extreme, because I think that the same thing with those guys. And I, I worked in a record store when More Than Words came out, and I, I remember uh, Housewives returning the record when they bought it and that album starts with decadence dance and this massive nuno riff whoa 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 what the hell is this where's that acoustic song and uh, they quickly wanted their refund and just buy the single and and i imagine there was some some of the same stuff going on when people heard uh like i said hostile youth when they picked up the lizard <laughs> we, 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 we love to provide an easy listening experience for uh for the population so but the dynamics but, but the dynamics of saigon kick to me is what always made the band special i mean you have all those sides and i think that's what was always so cool about the band so that that's what i'm you know it's kind of neat about doing it now is the funny thing is the passion and the fans have been so like you know when you put this thing together and you're sitting there talking to you know, just us internally you know you have no idea if you made an impact whatsoever and you go about your lives and you do different things and even on these you know these little five shows we've done it's been so unbelievably humbling the amount of passion, I mean, people singing every word from beginning to end, and, uh, you know, people even coming out of the woodworks from other bands that have been so, like, you know, oh, I was a huge fan, and, you know, I got it. It's kind of like this secret that people were like, you know, no, I got what you guys are about. You know, the rest of the country didn't. And it's really, it's really just been a lot more fun now, and I think, like I was saying earlier, I mean, people are just a lot more open to everything now, musically, so it almost feels in some ways that uh, the timing is a little bit better than it was you know, it, it, it's better for us now than it actually was then. I mean, people seem to be much more receptive to what we do now. And that's a great point, too. And we're talking with Jason Beeler of Saigon Kick is that uh, I remember even back when you guys first came out uh, 23 years ago or whatever it is, there, the people that got Saigon Kick really got it and were really into it. It was almost like a little secret handshake club. Like, we, you know, we know what this band really is about and really were passionate about the band. So it doesn't surprise me at all that the shows you've done so far has had that sort of reaction. Yeah, it's been it's been really amazing, and I mean, obviously, it's, it's great to see you know people that you haven't seen in a long time, and um, but that response is just you know, you, 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 like I said, you, you can assume that people are going to show up, or you can think maybe this will go well or that'll go well, but uh, you know, the, the people have made it just unbelievably amazing. I mean, like I said, they're singing, you know, which is great because half the lyrics we don't even remember anymore. But they're singing the songs. For, <laughs> they're singing the songs on top of the lungs from beginning to end, and no one even cares anymore. So it's not even like that kind of scene where. I think, you know, you know, where we grew up, obviously, you were a metalhead or you were a punk rocker or you were in a new wave, and, you know, and, and it was just, that was, you were culturally defined by those movements. And now people are, like, listening to everything all the time, so it doesn't matter whether it's electronica, heavy metal, I mean, even my son, you know, he's jamming all the Maiden tracks, like, he's just discovering this for the first time, and he's, like, you know, blown away by that. At the same time, he'll go into journalism and listen to Mouse, and that kind of accessibility to different styles of music, I think, is actually helping a band like us, which doesn't necessarily make... Uh, total stylistic sense back then or didn't at that time uh it helps us a little bit more now to be you know make a little more sense maybe let me, uh, before we talk about now and the future, I want to just move uh, a little bit more through the chronological history of Saigon Kick because what's interesting is that you, you have a first record that does uh, pretty well. Um, you know, a little bit of airplay, what you say, stuff like that. Then The Lizard comes out, does even better, huge hit with Love Is On The Way. But surprisingly, the band really kind of bottoms out after that with with matt your singer leaving and then you basically steer the saigon ship saigon kick ship and come out front and become the lead singer as well uh, talk about that period if you will 
it was, you know, I, I think, you know, you, you start to, like I said, you know, we were all still, I mean, I think this whole thing was over by the time I was 24 or 25, or at least that phase of it was. And, uh, you know, your egos get out of control. You have a hit record. Um, you know, obviously, it's all the other bands are never going to be Led Zeppelin because you guys are clearly going to be the, you know, this massive juggernaut of music. And your ego starts to, you know, you know get the best of itself. And, you know, we started fighting over the, in, you know, just unbelievably stupid issues. And, you know, I mean, it's so, like I said, it's so cliche, it's embarrassing. I wish we could have been more inventive and had, like, some really kind of great fight about something you'd never heard of before. But this was also typical and boring, and we split up. And, uh, you know, we were kind of isolated at that point because we recorded the, that record in Sweden. And Matt had left, and, you know, in, in our mind, it was like, well, let's just go ahead and make a record. I mean, what could possibly go wrong with the lead frontman going, you know, leaving, you know, this should work fine. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, you know it, it didn't exactly go as smoothly as we anticipated. We had a vision of this becoming like uh, a Genesis-like success with Phil Collins' uh, transition. And uh, needless to say that it is not exactly the way it, that it happened. Well, you didn't get Phil to come out and sing. You know, at least you know Genesis got Phil to come out and sing. You sang. And listen, I mean, I, you know, in all honesty, I mean, I loved uh, those records too. I loved Water and and the stuff that came after it. I really did. I, I, I mean, I don't. I mean that with no disrespect to to Matt or anything. Um, but I stayed with the band and I, I liked a lot of the material. And I mean, when you say the cliche infighting, I mean that happened. I mean, I imagine like 99% of the bands, it's about money and control and ego. And I know that, as I mentioned, you were the primary songwriter. So uh, usually when you see something like that too, publishing comes into play because you've got, you think of the old Twisted Sister story. Everybody knows D wrote every song they've ever done. And when they hit it, you know, D's living in a big house with, uh, with helpers and all that. And the other guys are in condos working day jobs. It's like, what happened when he didn't have any well, publishing? I was not like that at all. I mean, I, was, I offered them tents on my land. And everything else was nice. <laughs> <laughs> nah. You had a tent. Wait, Jason, you had a tent city on your land, but it was your other band members. Yeah, I was going to allow them to stay there. You know, I mean, we got to work at a reasonable rate. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I thought I was being quite nice, but you know, no. I mean, it, it, yeah, it was one of those things where I think I think part of it. It wasn't even so much the direct financials of it as much as that. I had been writing songs from the beginning, from when I was a little kid sitting in my bedroom, and so I was a lot more prolific in the sense that I would come in, to, if, we, if, if, if the assignment was to go home and write a song for the band, I would come in with a hundred songs and some of the other guys were kind of just working on their craft and obviously developing skill at it, but maybe a little bit behind in terms of the amount of music they could produce quickly enough. So I wound up having a lot of songs on the record. Um, I think also just uh, uh, um, from an eclectic standpoint of diversity of music, like I really had no sense of belonging to any musical movement whatsoever. So. You just as easily see me in a pit at a Pantera show as you'd see me literally more throw at a Barry Manilow concert. Like I, I have a real problem with uh, just loving every kind of music. So almost, your tastes, almost. your tastes are that diverse, huh? I mean, I listen to anything, and, and I enjoy playing anything. Generally speaking, I mean, I have a hard time with really twangy country. But other than that, I mean, I just love music. I love metal. I love you know alternative music. I mean, I've always been passionate about it. So I think. I started stretching the boundaries probably a little too far from an ego standpoint of like, hey, there's no reason why we can't do a polka thrash hybrid, you know, uh, you know, and bring in this Indian mystic influence. It'll should totally work. So I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of push and pull in those areas, and then just, you know, and just being young, and I think, you know, not respecting enough of what we'd achieved. You know, when it happens kind of quick, I mean, it didn't, look, we all worked our entire life to get to that point, so I don't want to make it sound like we were just sitting around and we accidentally got a record deal. But when you get on that train and it starts rolling, I mean, it, you know, uh, you know, youth is wasted on the young. Is my is my you know, it's like, you know, you can you need to have a little bit more maturity. And there's there's very few artists, at least that I've met, that can really hit any kind of success in their 20s, early 20s, and really sit back and make great decisions. I mean, obviously there are some that have done it, and they're legends. Um, we we do not fall into that group of uh, brain trusts. You know, we 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 don't do the typical, uh, you know, stupid arguments and infighting. And, well, there's responsibility for and that, a lot of that responsibility too falls on your manager. I mean, and I'm not I'm not I'm not dissing your manager. I don't know him, but I'm just saying that when you're a when you're a young band like that and you're worried about decisions, I mean, the, the bands that survive and and prosper and and go forward and have long careers, a lot of it can be traced back to did they, did their management consult them in the right way too to do the right things. You know, I agree with you to a certain extent, and I like you know I'm not a guy who likes to blame other people. Um, so at the end of the day, 
you know, we made those decisions and we, you know, we were told different, you know, we were always told, I mean, I had great people around me, I mean, you know, legends like Jason Flom and these guys who have signed all, you know, we had a good group of people generally around us, not necessarily speaking just about the manager, but, you know, you also get to that point when you're young and you're like, you know, it's like your parents telling you don't touch the stove, you're like, all right, fine, and then you go touch the stove, I mean, right. that, kind of, that kind of sums up the Saigon Kick career, is, you know, we kept touching the stove yeah, every time someone turned their back. So eventually the band, uh, the band with you fronting it, uh, ends. Uh, what year was that, that it finally, you finally just packed it in? It was, strangely enough, we had it was like this totally spinal tap because we were almost about to break up, and then we got told that we were like the biggest band in the history of Indonesia. Really? Um, so like, you know, like Sex Farm went to number one in, you know, in Japan kind of story. So we wound up going to Indonesia and playing all these, like, basically almost stadium-sized places, um, so it was like completely surreal because you're living, you know, you leave here feeling like your career's on the skids and nothing's really working, and then you go there and it's like this bizarre version of Beatlemania. And uh, we did some different, you know, touring around Asia and Hong Kong and uh, you know Korea and different places, and it was really pretty amazing. And then it just slowly started to like, you know, people started to have different interests, and uh, I started producing a lot more stuff, and you know, everybody just started to get to the point where like, you know, this is not the way we're gonna. You know, we want to drive it into the dirt, so to speak, so sometimes you just got to get off and, and uh, you know, reassess, and that's kind of where we got to. That story about Indonesia reminds me, I don't know if you saw this new documentary out called uh, Searching for Sugarman, but it's about a guy that didn't even know he was huge in South Africa. And uh, I, I tell everybody listening, check that documentary out. It's remarkable. It just came out on DVD. It's called... Yeah, uh, someone was just telling me about that. I heard, I heard amazing things about it. Yeah, Searching for Sugarman. It's amazing. I never even heard of this guy myself. And he was like a folk guy in the early 70s. But it's it's a remarkable story. It really is. Uh, are you still big in, in Indonesia? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure we, we haven't been back in quite some time, but we get offers to go all the time. And, you know, we're, we're, right now, I guess it's kind of weird because obviously Matt singing, we have that first two records, and we haven't really addressed the second two records, and um, who knows if we even will. Um, but over there, that part of the catalog is a lot bigger than, you know, the earlier part of the catalog. So, you know, we're kind of taking it step by step, and uh, it'd be awesome to get back there, though. I mean, it's a lot of fun. I mean, go, you know, spending two weeks in Bali, uh, there's worse things you can do with your time. Jason Buehler, Saigon Kick is my guest. Uh, Jason, so so when and how does does it come back together again? Because I know there were some rumblings that you guys might do something uh, a couple years ago, and now uh, we're at a point. It sounds it sounds like it's a bit of a tenuous point, to be honest with you. But we're at a point now where you guys are together, and you've just done a handful of shows. You've got one more scheduled, which is this Thursday in New York City at Webster Hall. Um, how? How did, how did, who called who to say, hey, you know what, let's get over it and let's go out and have some fun and play some gigs? Well, we've had a couple of different calls. I mean, Phil had called me up originally and mentioned some ideas and there was talk of doing this, you know, the shed circuit. There was a big tour that was going out that, you know, was interested in us and, you know, we kind of talked about it. And it was kind of one of those things like a scared dog going up to a water bowl. Like we would kind of approach it and then run away and then we'd approach it and run away and approach it and run away and finally, uh, you know, Matt and I went and had a, a lunch in Fort Lauderdale and kind of were able to, kind of put some of the stuff behind us and and then slowly we all started coming together and then um, we decided like look if we if we're going to do it we should do it and you know we put these shows together um and that, that kind of gave us that anchored reason to you know okay we're kind of committed and uh it's, you know obviously joking around i mean it's actually been great to be with everybody everyone's in a different space um i mean there's always going to be those kind of tensions but it's been a lot of fun everyone's getting along probably far better than we ever did before um but you know it's the same group of knuckleheads so i mean Anything can happen at any time. So who is in the band? Do you have all four of the guys from the first record? Or I know you said you have Phil and Matt, and but on bass you have, um, is it Chris, right? Chris McLaren, who toured the entire Lizard record with us. Um, we got together with Tom early on to rehearse, and uh, just things didn't work out for you know for him and for us at that time, unfortunately. And uh, but we're all cool, and, you know, and still speaking. So we, the four of us, decided to to roll with it. And, Take it from there. And I know that uh, in the downtime of Saigon Cake, when the band wasn't together, you've done some interesting things. I do. I just stumbled upon a CD that I actually almost completely forgot about, but I actually really loved that of another band you did, Super Transatlantic, uh, which I completely forgot about until I just started pulling out my Saigon Kick records again because it's in the mm -hmm. S's. It's in the same area. You and most other people. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and Pat Badger was in that band, huh? 
Yeah, it, it was a uh, it was a super group to be. Yeah. Uh, but it, you know, so Pat and I got together and we uh, had, had you know we did a deal with Universal at the time. And the big thing about that that makes me really happy is that we were able to be on the soundtrack for American Pie, the first movie. Right. So uh, so we, you know that was you know that's a big claim to fame from that that that, that endeavor. But uh, yeah, we started doing that, and then I think it got to the point you know where like you know label was like, well, you guys should go on the road now. And Pat and I looked at each other like, you know, I'm just not chasing about the country in a van playing for 50 people a night. Like, I mean, that's just not where I'm at, you know, mentally. Right. Uh, and he wasn't either. And so we kind of did what we did with that and let it roll. And then uh, up until, re you know, still I'm sure, but but in recent years, you and your brother have done a record label called Beeler Brothers and signed a bunch of bands and worked in production and putting records out. Uh, that's That's been the bulk of your, your work recently, right? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, probably in around 2000, 2001, we had the good fortune of running into a band called Nonpoint, um, and we started of working with them and signed them, um, and we're with them through their different labels, but we wound up on our label at one point as well, and then uh, we really got passionate about, you know, developing artists and trying to help, uh, you know, navigate them through some of these waters and work with bands like Skindred, a band called Six, uh, you know, Ankla, who's on Ozfest, um, you know, we've had bands on Warp Tour, so it's been a really really fun uh, part of my career just to be able to work with other artists and kind of kind of say like hey trust me like a lot of guys in the record business have never been on the other side of it like and I think sometimes a lot of artists feel comfortable knowing that you know I was in that venue that you're complaining about and I know the guy you're talking about and I know why that hotel is not the right hotel and I know why this radio station this guy's going to treat you like this but just keep your mouth shut and it's going to be better for your life you know I've been helping you know, helping them kind of navigate those waters has been really kind of fulfilling and, and a lot of fun. So we have uh, this Thursday, as I mentioned, here in New York City, the a Saigon Kick Show, and then there's nothing that I know of scheduled after that. What the, is the plan, if anything? We've been getting offered to do a lot of festivals um, and, and, and some different touring opportunities. We're definitely, at this point, uh, as of this afternoon, still continuing on. Uh, uh, we're just going to be real selective about uh, you know what we do, and we're waiting for you know to see what what the best opportunity is going to be for us, and uh, and we're discussing the possibility of you know doing a new song or two, um, but you know, we're taking it very very slow. Very fortunately, I mean, it, there's a lot of tragedies in the music business where this band and everybody's destitute. Now they're out on this tour, to, you know, they're trying to do a reunion tour, and it's a World War for Food tour, and you know they got to pay their mortgage. And fortunately, no one's in that position. Everyone's doing really really well. So we can kind of sit back and just do the things that make the most sense um, and uh, things that will be the most fun. And, you know, for me personally, the cities that have the best restaurants. Uh, <laughs> a, bit of a, a bit of a foodie, are you? A, a wee bit, you may have heard. Wow. Well, I, no, I actually didn't know that, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you have a good restaurant, please email me, and I'm sure we'll set sort of somewhere. Are you, talking, uh, are you talking, like, gourmet stuff or just food that you like? I will eat anything. So um, you're, you don't discriminate. You'll like, you know, you'll be into like kick-ass fast food just as much as like a gourmet restaurant. That that Adam Richmond guy really stole what I should have been doing with my life. Uh, you know, the, the man versus food gig. I think is probably the highest achievement a human being can possibly accomplish in entertainment. You know, you know something. You, it's funny you bring him up, Jason, because uh, I, I, I I'm at the gym trying to to shed some pounds, and fortunately I've been able to do it recently, but I still got some ways to go. But as I'm sitting there on the elliptical machine dying, I'm looking up and the TV in the gym had that show on and I'm watching this guy pound back food at the most disturbing rate. Even a fat guy like me was disgusted by it, but I found it really interesting to watch and to see. And I, I said on the air here a couple weeks ago, I'm like, how is that guy not having like 15 bypasses and, and be 500 pounds or whatever? Somebody told me, though, that now he actually has a stunt eater for him, that he, under doctor's orders, can't do that anymore. So you may have a gig. You may have a shot, Jason. Well, you know, there's always hope, right? I mean, I've been, I've been playing hockey the last five years. I've got a bunch of friends that are in the NHL, so I've been trying to stay really focused on that part of it. And, you know, at 45, I'm assuming that I'm uh, shooing for the Panthers any time now. <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, you know... If that if that pulls off, uh, you know, I'll have to put the uh, 
the food network on hold temporarily, but uh, I'm always open to discussing an offer. Hey, one of, uh, on the food thing too, one of my favorite restaurants in the world right now that just came to New Jersey, but started there, and there's a ton of them down there from what I understand, um, and here's a little free plug for them, is uh, a place called Anthony's Coal Fired Pizza. Did you ever go there? Do I ever go there? They have a pizza named after me in Coral Springs, Florida. Do they really? <laughs> no, but I just wanted to throw that in there. Because I was just at Nico McBrand's <laughs> restaurant in Coral Springs. Did you ever go to Nico's oh, yeah. Ribs? We were there. That's where we had our first band meeting, or ironically. Yeah, he's at, down the street from our houses. And he, he's, I saw him, and he's walking around taking care of everybody. It was awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I brought my son there over there, and he's kind of sat at the table. At first, my son didn't put two and two together. Right. I was like, no, no, that's the drummer from the band that you're, you know, he's like, oh, my God. <laughs> It's, uh, it's awesome having that around, yeah. Uh, but a Anthony's Coal Fired is killer, man. It's my it's my new addiction here in New Jersey. And my friends I talk to in Florida about it, they're like, it's been around like 20 years. That's old news. I'm like, no, nah, not up here. And this and we have good pizza up here, but this is, this, 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 that pizza and those chicken wings they make, insane. Yeah, that, that's a serious night out. I mean, you and I could do some serious damage uh, in the tri-state area, uh, you know, when, you, when, when your schedule allows. <laughs> I think, uh, do live broadcast from each of the great spots. Oh, yeah. I'll take you to my favorite Italian place in the world. is down in Little Italy here in New York called Vincent's, the best red sauce you'll ever have. Trust me, man. The problem is, though, you're you're a skinny rock star, and I'm trying to, you know, work my way down a little bit, so it's you're not a good influence. Trust me, I'm not a skinny rock star. That's one thing I've never been called, though. <laughs> you've, made, you've made my night. I mean, you don't look I, uh, like you do on these records anymore? Uh, you know, slightly girthier. <laughs> Slightly girthier. I mean, I've been called a big bone girl uh, <laughs> more than a few times. So I've been called husky when I was a kid, so I get it. Trust I, me. Well, ironically, I wore huskies as a kid, so I mean, now we're, we're really bonding. There you go, for real. Well, listen, man, I, ho I hope there's a future for the band because, as I said, I thought it got cut uh, abruptly short. I thought that the band was was very much ahead of its time, and uh, I'm really excited for the opportunity to see it at least one more time uh, here in New York this Thursday at Webster Hall. And uh, do, you have, do you have, like, an online thing set up where people can find out if you implode or not? <laughs> Yeah, uh, strangely enough, that's being updated on Twitter every hour. Uh, the, 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 the Saigon Tech Death Watch. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we have a, a, we're on the Twitter at Saigon Kick, and uh, we have a website, SaigonKick.com, and we're on Facebook and all those good things, and you can kind of tune in and, uh, and uh, you know, stand vigil for the momentary updates as to whether it's actually continued or not. And you can follow <laughs> Jason personally at Jason Beeler as well. Uh, listen, man, it's great talking to you. And uh, the last thing, and I think you kind of answered this earlier, uh, being that Matt is in the band, uh, these these shows you're doing, I'm assuming, are all the first two records? Yeah, we're focusing on the first two records uh, for this run. And then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of take on new challenges and, you know, as, as, it, as it takes shape. So. Well, very well. You can't go wrong with anything from these first two records. So, uh, I look forward to it, and, and maybe we'll even get my death dirge in there at one point in the show if it's in the set. <laughs> I'll have to make them re-rehearse that really quickly. Oh, you got to! It's so great. All right, man. Well, listen. Uh, I appreciate it. I played something from the Lizard. What should I play from the first record for people? What do you want to go out with? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I'm going to let you choose this one. Uh, well, I was thinking, at the opener, I was thinking New World, just because, again, it just shows the, the, all, I mean, from the, the the beginning of it, into the heavy part, into everything going on, uh, to me, I mean, that was the first time you, you put the CD in and heard that song. I was like, man, this isn't, this isn't like other stuff coming out in the 90s, so I, I was really into this. This isn't your dad's Oldsmobile. No, no. I mean, 1990. <laughs> this was kind of. This was different, man. This was. Uh, this was a, a, a blast of fresh air. I thought so. Well, I can't thank you enough for the support and taking the time to talk to me. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you a couple days. Absolutely. And, uh, thanks for everything, buddy. You got it, man. Jason, safe travels up here. Say hello to the guys, and we'll see you on Thursday in New York. Thanks, Eddie. Take care, man. Bye. -bye.